Josh, if engineering were Wonder Bread, you would be the refrigerated chunky peanut butter ripping it to shreds as you spread it across. <laughs> Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast for engineers, designers, makers, bakers, and Brooklyn-born CEOs of multi-billion dollar software companies mm -hmm. that have their own wood shop. I'm Josh. And I'm Adam. And uh, EVD is back, folks. Ah, uh, yes, we are back. And as always, we will be bringing you the freshest product design juice squeezed directly from the spot. Spongy gray matter in the skulls of our esteemed guests this week. We have the great pleasure to speak with a Cornell University graduate. No, surely you must jest. I do not jest, Josh. The one and only <laughs> oh. Carl Bass, CEO Carl of Autodesk. Bass, yes. But before that, we'll start with a design history lesson courtesy of SolidSmack.com. And I'll do my best not to be a moron, oh. courtesy of CadJunkie. Well, that will be a first <laughs> and... <laughs> A welcome development. Speaking of not being a moron, Josh, vanquish mm -hmm. the speckle-throated ox of uh, ignorance. <laughs> you say speckle-throated ox, so speckle -throated I always... <laughs> Okay, sorry. Speaking of not being a moron, Josh, vanquish the speckle-throated 12-headed dragon of ignorance with the rhinestone-encrusted broadsword of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? This week, Engineer vs. Designer is brought to you by Stratasys. 3D printing is creating the next industrial revolution, and Stratasys is leading it. See how at stratasysfor3dworld.com. Speaking of which, we have sent out mm. a tweet for this episode, mentioning Stratasys, by the way. Anyone who yes. retweets that message will be entered into a drawing for an Engineer vs. Designer t-shirt. Head over to twitter.com yep. slash evd1 and, uh, you know, help us yep. out. Yep. So uh, we talk uh, with Autodesk CEO Carl Bass this week. We recorded the interview yesterday, and uh -huh. it is killer. Yeah, it turned out pretty good. Mr. Carl Bass yeah. has been at the helm of Autodesk since circa 2006, uh, having Ooh. worked at Autodesk since 1993. And as you know, Autodesk has been around a quite a bit longer than that. So here's a quick history lesson uh, on how all of that came to be. Mm -hmm. Autodesk was founded in 1982. Same as me, by the way. <laughs> by a computer programmer named John Walker, whom a PC Week columnist dubbed the most brilliant and the most bizarre person I've ever met. <laughs> From the very beginning, Autodesk was very deliberately uh, keeping MBAs out of its top brass, ah. opting instead for a management team consisting almost entirely of programmers. Yep. Market capitalization hit $1 billion by 1999, and it is up to a gargantuan $8.76 billion today. Revenue in 2012 was 2.2 billion, up from 1.9 billion a year wow. earlier. 14% growth there. An impressive 26% of which was spent on the 566.5 million dollar R&D budget. Dang. They employ about 7,500 people worldwide. As of today, the all products page at Autodesk uh, <laughs> Autodesk.com. And I know this because I counted them one by one. What? There are 119 currently active products, Dang. almost all of which pertain to making stuff for design, engineering, film, animation, architecture, manufacturing, automation, uh, 3D scanning, machining, <laughs> and a whole bunch of other stuff. But their core products, mainly AutoCAD, Maya, and 3D Studio Max, account for a full 58% of total revenue, or about $5 billion. Now, design suites like product design suites that Josh or I would use account for a mere 27% of revenue, a paltry $2.3 billion. So, big acquisitions in 2012 included T-Splines for easy organic surface modeling. HSM Works for integrated computer-aided machining. TurboSquid for sharing 3D assets online. Instructables for sharing maker-centric how-to lessons online. Blue Ridge Numerics for fluid dynamic analysis. Scaleform for video game UI design. <laughs> Plan a platform for cloud collaboration. And a whole bunch of others. These guys are crazy. Yep, she's a big, big company, that Autodesk. And we're going to find out <laughs> more about that from Carl in just a minute. As it turns out, EVD has a Google Plus page. Yep. On this Google Plus page, we're going to throw out a quiz question with a random factoid from this very episode of Engineer vs. Designer. Yes, we will. Answer that question correctly in the comments and we'll send you something. What are, what are we going to send them, Josh? A 30-inch touchscreen monitor. What? Yes, a shirt, a cotton shirt. 
Oh, oh, that. And yes. uh, oh, and by <laughs> the way, we will also enter your name in a drawing for a free CAD Junkie uh, Pro subscription. Ooh, snazzy. All right, uh, get your comment muscles primed and ready there. Yes. Okay, now, uh, a lot of folks, myself included, have been interested in this whole 1, 2, 3D design thing uh, uh, from For Autodesk. tutorials on yeah. uh, CAD Junkie? Uh, well, y yeah, well, and we don't have any just yet, but um, yeah. I think we, we might need to. So, but uh, anyway, today, let, let's just talk a little bit about how that works. Uh, there are three ways of using uh, 1, 2, 3D design. Yep, very true. On the web with a plugin. Or on your iPad. Or on your Mac or PC. And on the PC, uh, you're presented with a pretty clean interface and a group of commands up top to create shapes and sketches and modify geometry and stuff. Yep, there are basically three parts to the modeling in it. Right, you create parts from shapes. Combine those parts into a model. And refine that model with details. Now, the details are uh, where it gets pretty fun. While it's it's pretty bare bones. Uh, you can trim, extend, and offset sketches and then extrude, sweep, or loft them uh, ah. with a handful of options to tweak, fillet, split, and uh, shell geometry. Adjusting and grouping geometry is very simple with the uh, selection-based options you have and manipulators that pop up on the screen and make those modifications. I especially enjoy the ability to apply some uh, pretty realistic looking materials to the model mm -hmm. from their material browser. And my son enjoys being able to download robot heads from their kit library. <laughs> Everybody cool. loves robot heads. After yeah. you're done, you can upload that to 123D or export the SDL file to send to your 3D printer of choice. It's very simple and very free, and you can download it <laughs> right away and get started. Both uh, of quick those attributes easy. are pretty powerful, but uh, to play devil's advocate, I will say that the, you know, it, um, if you are already using CAD of any sort, you're probably better off with whatever you're already using, of course. Um, but if you're not using CAD and you think you'd like to make something in 3D, uh, one, two, three D is actually an impressive uh, starting point for that kind of behavior. So uh, with that, I think we want to talk to this CEO guy. How about that? Okay, Carl. Uh, first things first. Uh, who are you, and where did you come from? <laughs> what planet? Are you I, uh, I, I I was born on you know planet Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can hear and, that uh, a little bit. <laughs> it, it, it's there a little bit, and uh, yeah. you know what? It's only taken like 55 years, and Brooklyn is cool again. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I I think that's so great that all of a sudden Br Br Brooklyn, is, you know, is the hot place to be. Right. Um, so um, yeah, I I, I I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised in New York City. I went to college in upstate New York. Uh huh. And. Uh, and, uh, All right, I've got another. So that's a big question, I know, but what I've got another huge one for you. What is Autodesk and why? <laughs> what? what, what? <laughs> these are like Zen koans. These aren't questions. <laughs> <laughs> and how? No, seriously. I mean, what, so, so I'm just curious from the from the okay. CEO standpoint, from the top level, what what is Autodesk? Why do you do it? What what is this thing? It's got so many oh. different facets. So, I mean, from our point of view, it's actually pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, and I understand why people from the outside don't see it. We see ourselves as making tools uh -huh. that enable people to be creative and imaginative and make the stuff they want. Right. And, and we, we're less discerning whether the thing is a movie or a game or an industrial product or a building or a bridge. Mm. Those are, you know, they're all things, you know, they're all conceptions. They start in people's minds. They have this idea to make this thing that's incredibly cool yeah. and something they care about. And then they go about doing it. And, you know, what we, what has happened over time, you know, an Autodesk is a 30 year old company. And so where it started was with just the idea, you know, it was a product called AutoCAD that let people document the idea they had in their head. And, you know, it was, it was, I think, mistakenly called, you know, computer-aided design. I mean, we are first 30 years later, all of us, getting to the point where the computer aids it all. <laughs> um, you know, it was mostly a way to, you know, record um, conventions and graphics. You know, a dash dotted line meant something, and, you know, this kind of circle and arc meant another thing, and arrowheads meant another thing. And so that's where, that's, that's where we started. Over the years, we evolved to the point of, okay, it's great to help people document their ideas. The more important thing is, as we get into it, is 
how do I make more interesting things? How do I make better things? How do I bring more things to market more quickly mm -hmm. by using software to do it? And so that's kind of the common thread that lies underneath this, is we look for places where um, there's a need for software tools to help people make stuff. Now, you're actually trained as a, a mathematician. So can you explain how does that experience help guide you as a CEO? And then uh, how does that uh, in turn help Autodesk? Well, you know, there's, there's one way you can look at it. It doesn't help me at all. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I, don't think in my, I, I don't think since being CEO I've ever needed to do an integral. Right. You know, I, I, you know Stokes' theorem doesn't come up every right. day. And, you know, <laughs> I, you know and, and, so I, and I think this is generally true about lots of higher education. The very specifics of doing that, you know, I haven't used in years. Although, you know, I started out as a – you know, a programmer, you know, writing software. Uh -huh. um, and there are lots of the math actually help. But as CEO, it doesn't really, except in the broader sense of what really, you know, math as the discipline is about is this combination of creativity and discipline, mm -hmm. yeah, you, all, all in the name of solving problems. And if you think about what a lot of our customers do, that's pretty similar. It's also when you think about running a large organization, you know, you go from problem to problem. You know, you're given a bunch of constraints, there's a bunch of things, um, you know, there are a bunch of knowns, there are a bunch of unknowns, and you have to go work, work through the problem. So the, the, the discipline and rigor of math training is good, but like I said, the, the specifics of it don't come right. into play every Well, day. I can imagine that at least having experience developing software is probably helpful to you anyway. For oh, that's, yeah. to, that's, to, that's totally helpful. Right, I mean, right. it, it's much easier to sit in. You know, I, I've been in product reviews all morning sitting there talking to people, uh -huh. you know, and it, it's much harder for me to bullshit them and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> now, you got, I mean, Autodesk is definitely known as a really – innovative company. You guys are always coming out with crazy new stuff. I mean, how do you, uh, you know, from the top level as CEO, how do you help foster that innovative spirit in the company? What, what, do, you, what do you do differently that, that allows for that? I think the first thing you really got to do in these places is you got to hire people who are w way smarter and more creative than you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, say, I, say, I say this to peers who are CEOs. I say, you know, I say it anywhere I can. If the CEO is the smartest person in the company, you're in deep trouble. Right. <laughs> you know, and unfortunately, I think too many actually believe that they are. Hmm. Um, you know, I, th I think being CEO or senior executive gives you a vantage point, but you definitely shouldn't be the smartest person. You know, so your job is to hire really smart, creative people and allow them to have the license to go out and, you know, take um, calculated risks. Hmm. Go out and explore. Go, you know, like some of the stuff we did, in, you know, for example, our whole push into mobile devices, which has been a huge success for us, came about because, you know, two guys decided that we had this relatively um, modestly successful product on the desktop for drawing and painting and sketching. And they said, this would be so cool on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And they went out and they did it. They didn't ask for permission. I mean, if they oh, you're talking about Sketchbook Pro. Yeah. Right. And if they came to, if they had come to me, you know, my job my job as an executive would have been to say something like, That's a really stupid idea. Uh -huh. Who would want to finger paint on a device that has a two inch screen? Uh huh. And who wants to get into mobile? Yeah. And on the other hand, these guys just went ahead and did it. I found out about it about three days before it launched. They said, you want to see this really cool thing we've been working on? <laughs> and, they, and they not only showed me like the technology, but they showed what people could draw with. And I said, this is awesome. Mm. And so they got, they got the right response, you know, and now 15 million users of Sketchbook later, uh -huh. it, you know, it, it, it's been an unqualified success. Yeah, that, I, I love that app. It's definitely one of my favorites out there. But you guys also buy lots of companies, right? So how, how do you balance the internal innovation with all of those acquisitions? So I look at, you know, I, we, we buy a lot of companies. You know, over the last few years, we've averaged, you know, 12 to 15 companies a year. Wow. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, this year, this year we, we may do 15 to 20. Um, but when you look out there, what we generally do is we go out and we find something that we're interested in, excited about. We say there's something interesting happening. And a little bit our first instinct is, is, is there somebody out there who's been doing this? Is there some you know, group of three guys 
who've been working on this for five years have, you know, put all their blood, sweat, and tears and parents' money mm -hmm. into right. this thing and know everything about it. And my instinct is if you can find those people and bring them in, that, that's a great start. You know, and, and it, I mean, it's not a question of where the innovation happens. You know, I mean, in some ways, you know, the most celebrated company in the world today for innovation is probably Apple. If you look at Apple, almost nothing gets invented at Apple. Mm. You know, you know, start, starting with the wheel to the Gorilla Glass to, to the MP3 design, it all came from little groups. What they did masterfully is put it together and brought it to hundreds of millions of people. Mm. And I see, you know, and I see our role a little bit the same way. There are times when we definitely have to develop things from scratch and we have plenty of capacity to do it. And we have lots of creative people. Other times the creativity is more in trying to figure out what does our customer really want to do? And so we look out there. So, you know, a great example is if you look at two recent acquisitions make total sense. Uh, one was the T-spline stuff. Uh-huh. I don't, I, I, Josh and I exchanged some email, but you know, you go out there and you, you look at the T-spline stuff and you go, really smart group of people, yep. really intuitive way to model. Yep. Could we have duplicated? Of course, but why would you bother? You have, you, you have a team you know, led by Matt that knows, that knows all about this, is passionate, they understand what it's capable of, they understand the limitations, and they align perfectly on where we wanted to take it. Right. You know, and so it became, you know, at least an equal, if not a better half of our fusion product. Huh. Uh -huh. Um, same, same thing with HSM works. We've always wanted to be more involved in the manufacturing part. And we went out and we looked, we must've looked at a dozen companies. Uh, you know, you look at that space and there's, I don't know, a dozen, a dozen and a half cam companies out there. Yeah. None, of, none of them hugely successful. Right. All, you know, kind of niche players and successful in a very sm small realm. And we said, who's doing this differently? Who's rethought the problem? And we went out and we saw the guys from HSM Works and said, rather than us be, you know, the experts in cam, we went and we found the experts in cam. I They've been in the industry. They understood it. He, you know, was already deeply integrated with SolidWorks, you know, so we could see the result of it. And we said, that's a much better starting point for us. We still have a huge amount of work to do in both those cases, but it's a better starting point. Well, that's that's great. I mean, it's a perfect transition because I had a, a, that was actually my next question is, and in, in fact, T-Splines and HSM Works in particular, we've talked a lot about those acquisitions on SolidSmack and Engineer versus Designer. We had Matt on the show to talk about it back when it happened. And um, I mean... So what I guess for those who don't know, by the way, these are both plugins for competitive product. These are plugins for SolidWorks and Rhino, um, which are not Autodesk products. So can you talk at all about the decision to keep developing plugins for competitors, basically? Yeah. I, so we, we, thought, we thought long and hard about it. And um, I think there's been this mistaken competitive strategy that most people have had in this industry uh -huh. that imagines that customers, large and small, will work in homogeneous CAD tool environments for, you know, uh -huh. that you'll only use one tool. Well, anyone who's ever done design and engineering realizes we all use multiple tools. We use lots of tools. Mm -hmm. And the, the fallacy in the old world strategy is I will exert some leverage to get people to use only my tools, you know, by somehow, you know, so in this case, it would have meant us hoping that if we take HSM works off SolidWorks and only put it on inventor, people will give up their SolidWorks and move to inventor. <laughs> my guess is that most of those users would give up HSM works <laughs> and instead yeah. choose a different cam package. Not all, but at, le at least half. Yeah. And, I think, I think a more enlightened worldview is that the tendencies, the pressures that make for heterogeneous tool environments have proven to be much more powerful over time than the ones that drive to uniformity. So we can expect not only that people use multiple tools today, they're going to be using more tools in the future. And so I would much rather have a customer using... Um, so in the case of HSM works, they, they may, they may be using SOLIDWORKS, but what would be so wrong if they use 
factory design suite to lay out their factory. They use HSM Works for CAM. They use AutoCAD for documentation. They use ForceFX for doing kinematic analysis. All the, you know, use our simulation online products, use PLM 360. So in the end, yeah, they, they have a different design tool. And I think it's just a more reasonable view of trying to allow customers to do what they want to do instead of being, you know, heavy handed about forcing forcing customers to do things that aren't in their best interest. Man, and I really hope that uh, that other folks at other companies out there are hearing this right now, because I can't tell you how happy it is, how happy it makes me to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and like EHSM Works was a great example. Um, so we're going to do three things with it. One thing we just did is uh, a whole bunch of guys just got back from SolidWorks World. Uh-huh. Think how funny, <laughs> think how funny yeah. a statement that was. Yeah. Um, so they just we got back a- from SolidWorks World, and we, we had a user group meeting there. And what we explained to them is, one is we're going to keep developing, you know, the platform for SolidWorks. And anyone who knows software development realizes in a product like CAM, you know, the real kernel of it will work on every platform. Mm -hmm. There's only a small amount that ties it to SolidWorks or to Inventor or any other platform. And so we're going to continue to make the most investment in making sure the things like toolpath generation are good. But we said we will make sure that it works on SolidWorks. And we said we would introduce an inventor product. And for us, what was even more important, we, we, we discussed and actually showed um, a CAM product working on Fusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, I mean, that's a, that's a great, and what we're saying to people now is regardless of where your models come from, you can use our CAM tools. And for me, th- that would be a success if somebody now finds it easier to use CAM tools than the ones that existed on the market before and buy those tools from us. That's a real success for everybody. Preach it. So uh, Fusion, you mentioned, uh, this is Fusion 360. Of course, you announced it at Autodesk University a couple months ago in Las Vegas. How uh, it's giving a, a, a greater uh, cloud presence to Autodesk, of course. And, uh, so how is Fusion 360 specifically uh, going to change the whole product development game? I think I think it's I think it's a great product. You know, I was talking to someone the other day who was kind of my one of my gurus when it came to using Inventor. If I had a question, I would call him and say, you know, how do you do this? How do you do this? And uh, oh wait, you can you can actually use Inventor. You personally, I can totally, I can totally use Inventor. Oh wow! Not a lot of CEOs can you know can use the products they sell. So I mean, that's that's cool. I I I I, I actually the the last few days. Don't tweet about this, okay. but, uh, <laughs> but in, order to, in order to be using HSM Works, I've been modeling all this stuff in SolidWorks. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Greg over here is dying. You said not to tweet that. Does <laughs> that PR, mean you want me to... The PR guy just took a crap when he heard me say that. <laughs> oh, my God. This, you realize we're recording this right now, right? <laughs> uh, oh, really? You're recording it? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. See, but no, I mean, great, H- I mean but back to the thing, HSM works only in SolidWorks. And so... Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't particularly like using SolidWorks, but, it, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but there were one or two things I thought that it did better than Inventor. You know, most of the time I was longing oh my for gosh. my Inventor, but, but, but I can, they I can use still my products. beating heart. What's going on here? My, my whole world <laughs> is flipping upside down. Exactly. But I can, I could use, but I can use both, both of the products. Anyhow, the guy I call that I call all the time for like inventor advice, especially like when I'm getting to doing stuff like analysis and simulation. I, I, he said for the last year and a half, he's barely used Inventor because he's been using Fusion the whole time. Huh. And I I've started to use it. I'm able to do stuff in it that I couldn't do before. Um, so the first the first thing is you know occasionally I'm working on some designs with other people. So you get all the Google Docs, ease of, you know, installation deployment. Uh-huh. You know, I don't install it on my machine. It's just there. I'm at, I'm at the office and I work on something. I go home. It's still there. We're, we're all connected online. So I go home and I work on it on Sunday afternoon. And, you know, my friend comes and looks on Sunday night and he sees what changes I made. You know, so you, you get this ease of deployment. You get collaborate, you know, you get the collaboration first with yourself. Then you get collaboration with small teams. Um, you kind of get data management without data management. Wow. You know, so, so, so all of this is managed. You have versions. 
Um, many of the things that, you know, frustrate you just about, I say the whole experience, you know, forget about the actual tool itself are just great. You know, just like, you know, you get with a Google doc, you know, I go home and the thing, the thing is always there. It's always backed up. So you get that nice part. Then the second part, you know, as you kind of dig down into the tools, you start getting the, the really nice part of using a tool with T-splines along with a tool that looks like Inventor or a parametric solid modeler, hmm. right? You know, you have two environments. One, I do organic shapes really easily, but, you know, then I want, then I want to drill and tap a hole. Right. And, it, and, and it's easy to do that as well. And so the mix of those environments um, – and the ability from that environment to send it off and, you know, do, to do CAM or simulation. Right now we can do simulation. We're just starting to get to be able to do CAM. That, that's really exciting. You know, and again, for, for the CAM stuff, being able to do, you know, program a part at home, go to, go to my shop and be able to cut it. Uh-huh. That's, off, that's awfully nice. So, I, you know, I love the direct modeling um, the power of the, you know, the, the shapes that you can do, the shape complexity that comes with T-splines is nice. So over, overall, it's really good. It also starts letting you do things like top-down design. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think many people have realized parametric solid modelers are incredibly powerful, but they also have some limitations. Yep. And what we, tr what we try to do is take, you know, the best, the best of both worlds and do that. We've also had some really good shape description tools and things like Alias, but you know they're mostly for serious professionals. Right, right. And yeah. uh, and you know, and, and T splines just simplifies that process. You know, where I was I was showing someone yesterday we were working on something, and the idea that you can go in and you know tweak a point or an edge and keep surface continuity right, on right. a you know complicated set of blends, and they said you know, and they were looking and saying. That would take forever oh, yeah. in, you know, whatever, pro <laughs> Absolutely. whatever product. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just do it, in it and it works. Um, so it's really nice. And, you know, particularly as you get this connectivity between being able to create complicated shapes. And we all have these digital fabrication tools that now can make complicated shapes, whether that's 3D printing or, right, right. or CAM, software, CAM software that does it. So it's, really it's a really nice combo. We're going to ask you about... 3D printing in a little bit, but in addition to 360 and the other uh, design uh, tools you have, you guys are really pushing the app game with the with the one two three design, one two three D sculpt. Uh, who is your target market for these, and and what do you really want them to get out of all that? So the tar the, t the target market for us is, um, you know, kids age seven to seventy. Mm. You know, be uh, okay. it's basically it's people who want to make things. It's people who want to, you know, design and create. They may be professionals during their day jobs, but giving them access to tools to make things easily. Mm. Uh -huh. And you're building a community out of it, it seems like. It, it's a huge community. You know, on all of our web properties and, so, you know, and web services, um, we just passed 100 million users. Wow. I mean, it, 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 it's a phenomenal number of people who are using one, two, three D tools, who are using instructables, um, sketchbook, Pixlr, you know, all, all the things we, you know, we've talked about and, and we, th we think it's really exciting. And so a couple of things we want to get, one is we want to make sure that people have access to these tools. Um, second thing is we learn a tremendous amount about it. You know, this is kind of our Petri dish. These are, these are our fruit flies, you know, in some ways, uh -huh. we, these applications. In which we, you know, you have to be much more careful when you have a big installed user base in terms of the changes you can make right, with, with right. those kinds of products. When you have products out there that are mostly mostly free, um, and people who are going project to project, they're not coming in, you know, Monday morning and have to be done by eleven with their design. Right. You can actually experiment a lot more, and you know, we do. You know, hopefully, we do it collaboratively with the community when they say, you know, we really would like it to work this way or this way. We, we go and we work, and so we've learned a tremendous amount about giving people easier to use design and engineering tools as a result of all the one, two, three D stuff that we've done. It's like having startup so, companies within your, within the larger Autodesk, which is, which is definitely. Abso powerful. Absolutely. I mean, we, we would not have known what was capable on the mobile devices 
if we hadn't started with Sketchbook. Right. Um, you know, we, we've already shown, and we showed it a little bit at AU, a, you know, a parametric solid modeling engine <laughs> running on an iPad. <laughs> running on an iPad. You know, one question is the those, sanity of doing that, but yeah, that's. I mean, it's cool. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we ju we just look at this and say th th this is a great way for us to learn a tremendous amount. It's a, it's a way to reach out to the community and build a strong community of people of designers and makers and engineers. Yeah. Um, and we hopefully take lots of those learnings back to our professional products. And over time, I think in its own right, you know, th these communities will actually become businesses for us. And now, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which uh, all of the things you've been talking about just now, in fact, but also just in general, I, I see a lot of parallels between Autodesk and Adobe. And I, I think I think that's a good thing, by the way. I mean that in a good way. You're, you're both huge players uh, in your respective industries, but uh, you also have huge portfolios of products uh, for virtually every need that a person could have in that industry. So uh, right now, for example, Josh and I are using Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, which means that right. you know, right now we're, we pay 50 bucks a month and we have access to every desktop application Adobe makes, period. All of it. Right. But, it, but, but in a nutshell, that, 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 I, I respect uh, Adobe hugely. The only thing I'd say is that sentence was the one that kind of throws me off. Yeah. We bought Creative Cloud and we had access to all the desktop applications. Yeah. There's, there's something wrong with that sentence. Well, why? why? I mean, uh, so call it whatever you want. I think that the idea <laughs> of... So, they, they should have called it Creative Desktop and it would have been... They should have called, called it Creative Desktop Subscription <laughs> and it would have been much more that's, accurate. That's fine. I mean, I, 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 yeah, okay. I'm, I'm with you there in terms of the, the uh, By no. the way, I, I think the subscription thing is actually a really good idea. It fits the needs of companies well. Lots of users like it, so nothing wrong with that. Well, I can tell that. you right now, I, I would, I, right now I'm not much of an Autodesk user. I have the occasional product. But if, right. if you offered a way for me to affordably subscribe where I could get a variety of your tools to mix and match without having to buy this one and that one and this plug-in and that plug-in, then I would switch in a heartbeat. I'm just telling you that right, right. now. I, yeah, no, and the the only addition I did, you know, I would say is what we're really interested in, and I'm sure Adobe will do this in time, is we want to make those offerings online because uh -huh. we think it has all those other natural advantages. So, um, but I I think it's a great idea. You know, we started with this, just the subscriptions in general, but doing it online is so powerful, and you know that's really what's captivated me is this idea of being able to do it on cloud and mobile. Uh -huh. That that, that 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 that's where I really think the future is for you know for the industry now. And you guys are you guys are really pushing into the 3D printing realm as well. You mentioned that earlier, as well as you know people buying shop bots and whatever for their house and you know these these kinds of these robots are proliferating in our homes. Can you can you tell us a little bit about where you guys are positioning yourselves in the 3D printing and maker revolution market and kind of how that, yeah. how that works? You know, the thing I, I mean, look, the 3D printers, are, you know, it's an overnight success that's taken 20 years. Right. <laughs> um, and, yeah. you know, they, they're great for things like prototyping and they always have been and they just keep getting better. You know, on one hand, the thing I love about 3D printing is the basic notion that shape complexity comes for free. Uh -huh. You know, if I design something else and I'm going to make it out of plastic or metal, I have to figure out how am I going to mold it, how am I going to cut it, how am I going to do something to it. With 3D printing, I hit the print button, <laughs> you know, you know yeah. and my, my 3D printer or the 3D printer halfway around the world couldn't care less whether I sent it a cube or the most complicated geometry in the world. Yeah. And that's, pre that's pretty cool. So yeah. I, I think it's really exciting. Now, there are also limitations, and, you know, people have been a little bit too, uh, I think, bullish about 3D printing. Uh -huh. You know, because I, th I think the bookend to it, the idea of shape complexity being free, is the idea that, you know, 3D printing is limited by the power of three. You know, meaning if you want to if you want to make something that you know that goes up, uh, that's twice as big, it's going to take eight times as long or cost eight times as much, mm. and that's just an inherent problem with it. In the mid, you know, so I think you have the bookends. You have this limitation on how fast it can scale. On the other hand, you have shape complexity being free. 
In the middle, what you have is lots of improved material science, improved in, you know mechanical engineering, making this stuff you know really starting to get reasonable, reasonably affordable, really high quality, and I think I think it's going to continue to do that. You know, the only thing I'd say is as excited as I am about 3D printing is just the idea of you know, software controlled manufacturing mm. of having digital fabrication controlled by computer. So, um, you know, there are some days I take a design and I send it to a 3d printer. Other days I cut parts out on a laser cutter. Other days I take it to my CNC router or my CNC mill. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea that I can do those easily as well, I think is really what's very powerful. And you don't think there's any difference in the, the fact that now people are doing these things in their garages as opposed to shop floors and, and manufacturing facilities? Oh, I, I think it's really cool that they, I, I think it's really cool that they're doing it at home. <laughs> you know, that, yeah, yeah, you I know, mean, does I, that I change the, the, the offerings that the Autodesk needs to offer if, if people are doing that? You know, um, but we don't, I mean, the, the companies out there are doing a great job. You know, I was talking to Bree the other day from MakerBot. Uh-huh. You know, he's, he, he's making like a thousand of these things a week. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, they're, they're flying off the shelves. I was talking, you know, I saw Peter from Shapeways and the, it was, you'd have to ask him, but it was more than 10,000 orders that he had filled between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, so people are having access, whether they have it in their garage, whether they go down to tech shop and use it, whether they have it in their school or whether they do it mail order. Right. So I, I think this easy capacity to have your ideas turn in, you know, you know, literally have the bits turn into atoms right. easily. Right. It's great. Yeah. And I think for each of us, we will choose which one we do. Um, you know, I, I, I was with someone yesterday and they were designing a PCB board. And they, and they were they were mailing it off to get manufactured, you know, and it was costing tens of dollars right. to have your own PCB board manufactured. I mean, I think that's incredible, the capacity that we're giving to small inventors and makers to have these kind of tools available to them. Well, that's got me uh, wondering something. You, you have your own shop, a huge shop. I, I keep hearing things about it. I haven't been there yet, but... <laughs> It, it well, really when cool. you come out here, when you come out, you're invited to come see it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm wondering, it is you've been talking to MakerBot and Shapeways, who knows about all what? But are we going to see an Autodesk, uh, a piece of hardware from Autodesk? Oh, wow. for 3D printing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the way I would look at it for Autodesk is, remember when Apple produced a laser printer? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. It's not really. It's not really because they wanted to be in the laser printer business. It was more they wanted to make sure that at the time desktop publishing. Yeah, they needed took PostScript off. to take off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Right. So if we really, I would be more interested in making sure that there's healthy competition and lots of innovation. Um, uh, but you know, I'm not wholly against doing doing hardware. Although you know, to date, ninety nine point nine percent of what we've done is software. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of our, our expertise is more in software. But, you know, even companies, you know, you've seen like Microsoft. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, the Xbox. Oh, they do lots minor, of hardware now. Yeah. Right. You know, mine is its thermal problems is a really nice piece of hardware. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and Apple over the years has gone back and forth and does, you know, hardware and software. And many companies do. You know, and, and you know, it's. It wouldn't be so strange because when you look forward, many of our customers, the the things they're making in the future, are some uh, some interesting combination of hardware, uh, hardware, software, um, you know, electronics. Right. Um, that that's what the products of the future look like. But I I wouldn't look for an Autodesk 3D printer, you know, at least next uh-huh. month. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you have kids, right? Uh, uh, I do. I do. Yeah, a few. Uh, have you exposed uh, them to 3D printing uh, and uh, the Autodesk apps? I'm, I'm sure you have. What what sort of things are they making? As you, you find out with kids, you can expose them all you want. To, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what it takes. Sure. One, one of them is to- <laughs> totally capable um, of using all the tools, and we do lots and lots of projects together. Um, the other one is very selectively interested. Uh-huh. And, you know, he doesn't like making for the sake of making. If he, there's, you know, he wanted a baseball bat, we made a baseball bat. Right. You know, he wanted some. The other, the other one is just happy to get up on a Saturday morning and say, let's go down to the shop and make stuff. Right. 
Um, and he's also more than willing to give me criticism of uh, what works and what doesn't work in our software. <laughs> you know, he'll tell me in SketchUp I can do this. And, you know, right, uh, right. And in, and in Tinkercad I can do that. Why can't I do this? And when, I'm like, okay. Why don't you write down, give me a list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're looking at the right stuff. We love Tinkercad too. Mm-hmm. Where, where do you see Autodesk going? And where, where do you see Autodesk being in 2020? W- will we be using uh, your software and what's it going to look like? Well, I think, yeah, yes. Yeah. I, I don't know about you guys. You guys, you guys are such a, so recalcitrant in the software you use. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't, don't count us out. Don't count yeah, us yeah. out. Don't Most engineers and designers will be using our software. Um, and I think you're seeing hints of it with the stuff that we're doing, you know, right now, the mobile devices are incredibly powerful. You know, when you, I ride home on the train and I'm able to use real engineering software on, on a device I carry, I don't know, was it weigh a pound or something? So I think the form factor for the devices we're going to access this on has really changed completely. So that's the first part of it. Um, the second part is tapping into the power of the cloud for some of these things like simulation, using the cloud for things like collaboration. Um, this morning I was watching a session of, uh, of AutoCAD, uh-huh. um, but substitute any of your pro- you know, favorite products in there, in which there was simultaneous editing between the desktop, um, the web, and the mobile version. Mm. Okay. So one per one go. person in a browser, one person on the de- on the desktop version, one one person on a tablet, and the things are the, the things you know they're collaboratively editing. And that and is a it, product I would definitely pick up and use. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yes. And so, and so, the, so, so when you so you know when, when I look out to the future, I say, look, we have massive computing power, and I, I've talked about this a lot, you know. Uh, labeled it somewhat extremely as infinite computing. Uh But, you know, when you look at the idea that we can tap into massive amounts of computing, I think the real question, you know, for designers and engineers is, you know, if computing was free, if I had access to all the computing I ever imagined, what would I do with it? Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, we haven't made that leap yet. We're still working in the way we have before. You know, we're doing it with better products and with, you know, faster computers. But I think there's um, both a mindset and a tool set leap coming up where, where you actually end up saying things like, what, you know, what, what, what if I had all that power? You know, so one of the things we did with our simulation 360, we said, as opposed to people doing one design after another, one iteration after another, and testing it, you know, which I said was like the game of Battleship, uh-huh. you know, where the, where the designer says B2, and then the analyst says miss. <laughs> and, then do, yeah. Yeah. and then you do it again and again until you run out of time or money or patience. What if on, you know, the typical kind of engineering problems where you're trading off strength versus weight versus cost, we could find the optimal solution. And if you're willing to use a lot of computing power, it's fairly easy to do that. Hmm. So I, I look at that and say, those are the kind of changes I see. So we're setting the foundation by having these collaborative platforms that run on new devices and tap into the power of the cloud. And I think that's the first step. The next step is when we make that kind of mindset shift to, okay, computing is virtually free and infinitely scalable. What will I do with that power? Hmm. Well, Carl Bass, CEO of Autodesk, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. I, I'm Absolutely. so glad we got to talk to you. By the way, I looked up the world word uh, recalcitrant, and it says an adjective having an ob- obstinately uncooperative attitude toward authority. <laughs> so uh, I, f- I feel like I like that word. I'm glad you chose it. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I, 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 yeah. Thanks for taking the time, and I'll go figure out my my fictional vacation place. <laughs> All right, you work on that. Thanks so much, Carl. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. This week, Engineer vs. Designer was brought to you by Stratasys and their full line of 3D printers that are turning dreams into reality. From the Mojo and Object printers to the Fortis production systems, there is a Stratasys solution for every customer. More at Stratasys for a 3 dworldcom Well, I have got to say that 
was a fun interview. Dude, that was that was a pretty sweet interview. In fact, Adam, having Carl on the show was huh? even more fun than that oh, time yeah. you jumped down a double flight of stairs oh, and yeah. sent your kneecaps flying oh, through the that memories. plate glass If you'd like window. to send me <laughs> some new kneecaps, 3D ah, printed geez. ones, preferably address them to Adam and send them mm. to EBDHQ, I will use them. I'll take any spares as well because I can't <laughs> seem to find mine. We love you and your comments. Please let us know what you think, who oh, yeah. you want to see on the show, and what you would like to hear more about at engineerversusdesigner.com or on the EVD YouTube and Vimeo channels. Uh, don't forget also to stop by the EVD Google Plus page if you'd like to see how many times someone can be electrocuted through a frayed microphone wire. Be sure to like us, plus want us, tweet us, or whatever else us, as social media has been correlated with continuous and detrimental shocks to the cerebral cortex. <laughs> this show was edited by the masterful Simon Martin. You can find our music this week on our shiny new Spotify playlist where we'll bring mm -hmm. out the latest and bizarre, awesome, and bizarrely awesome repetitive sounds for your work day. We'll see you next week. And remember, without designers, engineers would work in color palettes consisting of gray and ugly. Ah, and without engineers, gray and ugly would never have defined generations of industrial design. Ooh, out again. <laughs> Boom. A production of EBD Media.